Chapter six of My Doggy and I by Robert Ballantyne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter six relates a stirring innocent. Now it was at this critical moment that I chanced to come upon the scene. I had just ascertained from the brass plate on the door that Dr. McTougall dwelt there, and was thinking what an ugly, unromantic name that was for a pretty girl, as I descended the steps, when Dumps's first yell broke upon my astonished ears. I recognized the voice at once, though I must confess that the second yell from the interior of the watering pan perplexed me not a little but the hideous clatter with which it was associated and the sudden bursting out of flames in the drawing-room drove all thoughts of dumps instantly away my first impulse was to rush to the nearest fire station but a wild shouting in the lobby of the house arrested me i rang the bell violently at the same moment i heard the report of a pistol and a savage curse as a bullet came crashing through the door and went pretty close past my head then i heard a blow followed by a groan this was succeeded by female shrieks overhead and a violent undoing of the bolts locks and chains on the front door thought is quick burglary flashed into my mind a villainous looking fellow leaped out as the door flew open i recognized him instantly as the man who had sold dumps to me i put my foot in front of him he went over it with a wild pitch and descended the steps on his nose i was about to leap on him when a policeman came tearing around the corner just in time to receive the stunned brassy with open arms as he rose and staggered forward just so don't give way too much to your feelings i'll take care of you my poor unfortunate fellow said the policeman as a brother in blue came to his assistance already one of those ubiquitous creatures a street boy had flown to the fire station on the wings of hope and joy and an engine came careening around the corner as i turned to rush up the stairs which were already filled with smoke i dashed in the first door i came to a lady partially clothed stood there pale as death and motionless quick madame descend the house is on fire i gasped in sharp sentences as i seized her where is your your she looked young sister i cried as she resisted my efforts to lead her out i've no sister she shrieked your daughter then quick direct me oh my darling she cried wringing her hands where i shouted in desperation for the smoke was thickening upstairs she screamed and rushed out intending evidently to go up i caught her round the waist and forced her down the stairs thrust her into the arms of an ascending fireman and then ran up again taking three steps at a time the cry of a child attracted me i made for a door opposite and burst it open the scene that presented itself was striking out of four cribs and a cradle arose five cones of bedclothes with a pretty little curly head surmounting each cone and ten eyes blazing with amazement a tall nurse stood erect in the middle of the floor with outstretched arms glaring instantly i grasped a cone in each arm and bore it from the room blinded with smoke i ran like a thunderbolt into the arms of a gigantic fireman take it easy sir you'll do far more work if you keep cool straight on to the front room fire escapes there by this time i understood and darted into a front room through the window of which the head of the fire escape entered at the same moment sending glass and splinters all over us it was immediately drawn back a little enabling me to throw up the window sash and thrust the two children into the arms of another fireman whose head suddenly emerged from the smoke that rose from the windows below i could see that the fire was roaring out onto the street and lighting up hundreds of faces below while the steady clank of engines told that the brigade was busily at work fighting the flames but i had no time to look or think indeed i felt as if i had no power of volition properly my own but that i acted under the strong impulse of another spirit within me darting back towards the nursery i met the first fireman dragging with his right hand the tall nurse who seemed unreasonably to struggle against him while in his left arm he carried two of the children and the baby by its nightdress in his teeth i saw at a glance that he had emptied the nursery and turned to search for another door 
during the whole of this scene which passed in a few minutes a feeling of desperate anxiety possessed me as to the fate of the young lady to whom i had given up my doggie i felt persuaded she slept on the same floor with the children and groped about the passage in search of another door by this time the smoke was so dense that i was all but suffocated a minute or two more and it would be too late i could not see suddenly i felt a door and kicked it open the black smoke entered with me but it was still clear enough inside for me to perceive the form of a girl lying on the floor it was she miss mctougall i shouted endeavouring to rouse her but she had fainted not a moment now to lose a lurid tongue of flame came up the staircase i rolled a blanket round the girl head and all she was very light in the excitement of the moment i raised her as if she had been a child and darted back towards the passage but the few moments i had lost almost cost us our lives i knew that to breathe the dense smoke would be certain suffocation and went through it holding my breath like a diver i felt as if the hot flames were playing round my head and smelt the singeing of my own hair another moment and i had reached the window where the grim but welcome head of the escape still rested with a desperate bound i went head first into the chute taking my precious bundle along with me a fireman chanced to be going down the chute at the time carefully piloting one of the maids who had been rescued from the attics and checking his speed with outspread legs against him i cannoned with tremendous force and sent him and his charge in a heap to the bottom this was fortunate for the pace at which i must have otherwise come down would have probably broken my neck as it was i felt so stunned that i nearly lost all consciousness still i retained my senses sufficiently to observe a stout elderly little man in full evening dress with his coat slid up behind to his neck his face half blackened and his shaggy hair flying wildly in all directions chiefly upwards amid wild cheering from the crowd i confusedly heard the conversation that followed they're all accounted for now sir said a policeman who supported me the elderly gentleman had leaped forward with an exclamation of earnest thankfulness and unrolled the blanket not hurt no thank god lift her carefully now to the same house and who are you he added turning and looking full at me as i leaned in a dazed condition on the fireman's shoulder i heard the question and saw the speaker but could not reply this is the gentleman as saved two of the children and the young lady said the tall fireman whom i recognized as the one into whose bosom i had plunged on the upper level ay and he's the gentleman said another fireman who shoved your missus sir into my arms when she was bent on running upstairs isn't this so said the little gentleman stepping forward and grasping my hand still i could not speak i felt as if the whole affair were a dream and looked on and listened with a vacant smile just at that moment a long melancholy wail rose above the roaring of the fire and clanking of the engines the cry restored me at once. "'Dumps! My doggie!' I exclaimed, and bursting through the crowd, rushed towards the now furiously burning house, but strong hands restrained me. "'What dog is it?' asked the elderly gentleman. A man, drenched, blackened, and blood-stained, whom I had not before observed, here said, "'A new dog, sir, Dumps by name, come to us this very day.' we put him in the scullery for the night again i made a desperate effort to return to the burning house but was restrained as before all right sir whispered a fireman in a confidential tone i know the scullery the fire ain't got down there yet your dog can only have been damaged by water as yet i'll save him sir never fear he went off with a quiet little nod that did much to comfort me meanwhile the elderly gentleman sought to induce me to leave the place and obtain refreshment in the house of a friendly neighbor who had taken in his family you need rest my dear sir he said come i must take you in hand you have rendered me a service which i can never repay what obstinate do you know that i am a doctor sir and must be obeyed i smiled but refused to move until the fate of dumps was ascertained 
Presently, the fireman returned with my doggy in his arms. Poor Dumps! He was a pitiable sight. Tons of hot water had been pouring on his devoted head, and his shaggy, shapeless coat was so plastered to his long little body that he looked more like a drowned weasel than a terrier. He was trembling violently and whined piteously as they gave him to me. Nevertheless, he attempted to wag his tail and lick my hands. In both attempts he failed. His tail was too wet to wag, but it wriggled. "'He'd have saved himself, sir,' said the man who brought him. "'Only there was a rope round his neck, which had caught on a coal scuttle and held him. "'He's not hurt, sir, though he do seem as if someone had been trying to choke him.' "'My poor doggie,' said I, fondling him. "'He won't want washing for some time to come,' observed one of the bystanders. There was a laugh at this. "'Come now. The dog is safe. You have no reason for refusing to go with me,' said the elderly gentleman, who I now understood was the master of the burning house. As we walked away, he asked my name and profession, and I thought he smiled with peculiar satisfaction when I said I was a student of medicine. "'Oh, indeed,' he said. "'Well, we shall see. But here we are. This is the house of my good friend Dobson.' city man capital fellow like all city men <clears throat> he has put his house at my disposal at this very trying period of my existence but are you sure dr mctougall that all the household is saved i asked becoming more thoroughly awake to the tremendous reality of the scene through which i had just passed sure my good fellow do you think i'd be talking thus quietly to you if i were not sure Yes, thanks to you and the firemen, under God, there's not a hair of their heads injured. Are you, I beg pardon, are you quite sure? Have you seen Miss McTougall since she? Miss McTougall, exclaimed the doctor with a laugh. Do you mean my little Jenny by that dignified title? Well, of course, I did not know her name, and she is not very large, but I brought her down the chute with such violence that an explosion of laughter from the doctor stopped me as I entered a large library, the powerful lights of which at first dazzled me. Here, Dobson, let me introduce you to the man who has saved my whole family and who has mistaken Miss Blythe for my Jenny. Why, sir, he continued, turning to me, the bundle you brought down so unceremoniously is only my governess. Ah, I'd give twenty thousand pounds down on the spot if she were only my daughter. My Jenny will be a lucky woman if she grows up to be like her. I congratulate you, Mr. Mellon, said the city man, shaking me warmly by the hand. You have acted with admirable promptitude, which is most important at a fire, and they tell me that the header you took into the escape with Miss Blythe in your arms, was the finest acrobatic feat that has been seen off the stage. I say, Dobson, where have you stowed my wife and the children? I want to introduce him to them. In the dining room, returned the city man. You see, I thought it would be more agreeable that they should all be together until their nerves are calmed, so I had mattresses, blankets, etc. brought down. Being a bachelor, as you know, I could do nothing more than place the wardrobes of my domestics at disposal of the ladies. The things are not, indeed, a very good fit, but this way, Mr. Mellon. The city man, who was tall and handsome, ushered his guests into what he styled his hospital, and there, ranged in a row along the wall, were five shakedowns, with a child on each. Seldom have I beheld a finer sight than the sparkling luster of their ten still glaring eyes. Two pleasant young domestics were engaged in feeding the smaller ones with jam and pudding. We arranged the words advisedly, because the jam was, out of all proportion, too much for the pudding. The elder children were feeding themselves with the same materials, and in the same relative proportions. Mrs. McTougall, in a blue cotton gown with white spots, which belonged to the housemaid, reclined on a sofa. She was deadly pale, and the expression of horror was not quite removed from her countenance. Beside her, administering restoratives, sat Miss Blythe, in a chintz dress belonging to the cook, which was ridiculously too large for her. 
she was disheveled and flushed and looked so pleasantly anxious about mrs mctougall that i almost forgave her having robbed me of my doggie miss blythe your deliverer cried the little doctor who seemed to delight in blowing my trumpet with the loudest possible blast my dear your preserver i bowed in some confusion and stammered something incoherently mrs mctougall said something else languidly and miss blythe rose and held out her hand with a pleasant smile well if this isn't one of the very jolliest larks i ever had exclaimed master harry from his corner between two enormous spoonfuls ha exclaimed master jack he could say no more he was too busy we all laughed and much to my relief general attention was turned to the little ones you young scamps the lark will cost me some thousands of pounds said the doctor never mind papa just go to the bank and they'll give you as much as you want more pudding demanded master job the pleasant-faced domestic hesitated oh give it to him act the banker on this occasion and give him as much as he wants said the doctor good papa exclaimed the overjoyed jenny how i wish we had a house on fire every night even dolly crowed with delight at this as if she really appreciated the idea and continued her own supper with increased fervor thus did that remarkable family spend the small hours of that morning while their home was being burned to ashes End of chapter six